Welcome to Roberts and Jettis Live, this time for March the 27th, Wednesday. And as you know, this program is set aside for you to ask your questions, give your comments on any topic whatsoever. And I, as my role as host of this program, will endeavor to answer your questions to the best of my ability using our Catholic faith, scripture, tradition, the popes, the councils, the fathers, the medievals, the saints, the doctors, the catechisms, the encyclopedias, and just about anything I can find to help you walk away satisfied that your question has indeed been answered. We come to you every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m., barring any difficulties, and the skies are clear today, so we will not have any difficulties, and I have a few email questions and a few news items that I want to share with you, and um, believe it or not, they concern our present Pope. So, um, you know, when I was growing up as a Catholic, you hardly ever heard about the Pope. You just lived your Catholic life, and you, you knew your parish priest. You hardly ever saw your bishop, except when he came down for confirmation. And um, the Pope, unless he made headlines for some reason, um, he was not a topic of discussion. And in those days, now I'm not going back to the 1800s now, but, you know, mid mid 1900s in those days um um now i lost my train of thought because i'm shuffling papers here and um okay yeah you you he was not a topic of discussion unless he made it to the new york times or you know chicago tribune or whatever washington post and um, they were they were all you know more or less neutral about the Pope. And um, even though they're Rep Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, um, you know, after World War II and into the late fifties and sixties, it was just a fact of life that you you know you were either bent one way or the other politically or financially or and you know not that much was made of it and especially the pope never got into the discussion um the only time i remember the pope coming into a discussion uh now i was in grade school at the time was um 1968 and nine about humane vitae the you know cyclical paul the sixth wrote against uh, contraception, artificial contraception. And um, yeah, you did hear a lot about Vatican II, but it was like the Vatican does what the Vatican does. And um, it just wasn't, a, you know, a gigantic big deal. But we got into... Um, the um 2000s and it's like wow the, the pope is a daily topic of conversation and not only because we have the means by which we can do that you know you can type something up on your computer and you can send it across the world in a half a second or less and uh will affect a lot of people that is just the nature of the beast. Um, so you wonder what that would have been like back in the 1960s or so, when they, when they had Vatican II and Humane Vitae and all that stuff. Um, so, but you now you have, but you have a double whammy with a guy like Francis, because almost every other statement he makes is controversial. Into the point where um, 
you just wonder what is going to come out of his mouth next. You know, I mean, I have to be honest. <laughs> He's the Pope. I respect him as the Pope. He'll be my Pope to the day he dies. And, um, you know, all that goes with that. But um, I, I don't have to tell you guys this. I'm, I'm sure you've, you've, if you are breathing and can hear at least a few notes, uh, you know there's a big controversy with Pope Francis. Even his bishops have told him this. You know, all the African bishops say, hey, <laughs> you know what you can do with that fiducia supplicants? Yeah. Put it where the sun doesn't shine. Because, um, you know, um, we knew that when he got in there, he... He had a bent toward accepting homosexuals uh, from the time he was a bishop in Argentina uh, until the present day. I mean, he and when he was a bishop in Argentina or archbishop, whatever, he wanted to have uh, civil unions for homosexuals. He wanted it. They didn't do it, I don't think, but he wanted it. So we know where he's coming from. You know, when I was interviewed by some Protestant back in 2013 about what I thought about the new Pope. And I said, who knows, but um, he may be good on everything else, but he's got a problem with this homosexual issue. He is as lenient as lenient can be. And when he puts out a thing like fiducia supplicans and says that we can give blessing to them, this this is just totally as innocent as it may be on the legal scale, you know, because he's not condoning homosexual marriage. That's great, of course. Um, and um, you know, he's he's sort of um, very you know, treating as as gingerly as he can. Um, on the legal level, you know, he hasn't crossed the Rubicon yet. But as far as the practical side of this issue, because you cannot, you cannot really divorce the legal side from the practical side, because the legal, you may, you may cross all your T's and dot all your I's, legally speaking, but everyone knows what's going on. I mean, like, look at the Trump cases right now. I mean, <laughs> if this isn't an attempt to get Trump off the ballot or to get everybody to hate him so they don't vote for him, I don't know what is. Okay? So legally, you know, he has to go through the legal steps, go to court and be reprimanded by the judge, and the appeals court turns it over and... You know, you go through all that legal stuff, and if anything sticks, of course, he's got a problem. Um, but the practical side of it is we all know why they're doing this. Now, I don't care if you you vote for Trump or Biden. Um, well, I, hope, I, I wish you wouldn't, wouldn't vote for Biden because of his stand on abortion, of course, and many other things. And this is another thing, is the bishops of the United States are all for Biden. They're just, they don't care about the abortion issue, contraception, the tra sex trafficking, the, the border. Um, and, and this is what I really hate about, and I keep, I'm sorry to keep jumping topics here, but I hate about the Catholic mentality among the bishops because they're all liberal. They're all, I, I don't know. There may be five bishops that are conservative. So they're all liberal, and they all think that they're practicing the Catholic religion by wearing their heart on their sleeves and saying, well, we got to take care of all these immigrants and, and let the floodgates open and blah, 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 blah. And they think they're being so Christ-like in having that kind of mentality where you let anybody in at any time. And the borders are a curse. They're a legal curse. Uh, and we got to get rid of them and all. This is a kind of stupid liberal mentality 
that most of the Catholic bishops have, and they're really disgusting to watch it. Um, I'm just like appalled at their total lack of of um, using the legal system to get what should be done done, and and instead of skirting it, and then claiming that you're following Christ right after you just ignore the laws that have been set up that Jesus and Paul themselves said we have to obey and if they're um, not doing anything immoral and there's nothing immoral by um, vetting out a alien who wants to come into the United States one by one which is what the law requires. Um, so we're not saying that you can't bring them in. I'm just saying, look, you have to have a vetting process because you don't want sex traffickers, drug addicts, drug dealers, and any other kind of immoral behavior coming into the United States. You will destroy your country. You know, plus the you know the fentanyl and all that stuff. Um, but no, no. See, they're they're just, you know, there's a greater law here that is uh we have to go by which is that everybody deserves mercy and so break down those barriers and forget the vetting process you know um and the whole world's laughing at us taking advantage and they're laugh basically laugh and then and the bishops get their reward they get a hundred million dollars a year from the u.s government for all their little liberal shenanigans their little secret NGOs now that they have. So, um, you know, but back to Francis, and he's part of this whole problem because he's liberal-minded just like they are. And uh, they think they're serving Christ. They really do. You know, once Jesus said, what was it John 16, verse 2, he said, they, um, how's it go? Um they they will kill you, and by doing so, they think that they're worshiping God. That's how bad it will become. Um, and this is this is the point uh, that that fits with these liberal Catholic clerics. They have um, got to the point where they can slander you, and um, um make you look like you're not a Catholic because you disagree with them. Uh, they will excommunicate you, uh, you know, whatever they can to make it look like they're dealing with you is, and, and killing you in the sense, because, you know, once they, they make you out not to be a Catholic and excommunicate you or marginalize you or whatever, they're essentially killing you spiritually. And they will do so thinking that they're serving God. This is what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were like in Jesus' day. They were so fixated on their way of doing things that... Um, anybody else who even deviated a little bit from it were condemned. They were ostracized. And, um, and Jesus says they'll get to the point where they even kill you and think that they're serving God. Okay? So, um, uh, so, he, so here the, the Pope Francis says that the South American migrants are the suffering flesh of Christ. This was uh, put out March 21st, 2024 uh, from Breitbart. And they're the suffering flesh of Christ. And you look at this and you're going, wow, what did, the, what did these people do before the floodgates were open for them to come to the United States? Just what? A few years ago. What were they doing then? Apparently, they survived and were living well. They have clothes. They had pro they had food. They had housing. Um, 
So what's the deal? Why all of a sudden do they want to come to the United States in droves? Because there's somebody behind this. That's why. Convincing these people that, oh, yes, you're going to have a better life in the United States. And, you know, that sort of American dream. We all know that's all puffed up, don't we? Yeah. The ones that are going to have the dream lived are the people with the money. And most of the people in the United States, the citizens, don't have the money. Okay? Most of the population of 300,000, whatever we have, there's only 1% of them, maybe two, maybe three, that have enough money that can actually say, yeah, we're living the American dream. Everybody else is not. They can't even pay their bills. Okay, especially now that the food prices have gone up and the gas prices and everything else. Um, and we're teetering on this, what, $30 trillion debt that we have. Who's going to pay that? You know? Yeah. So talk about suffering, the f- suffering flesh of Christ. My goodness. This country's $30 trillion in debt. Yeah. Um, well, that's no suffering. You see, because we give the appearance like we're all living wealthy and this and we have this and that and other thing. And we're all living in debt. That's the issue. Okay, we live in a debt economy. This whole economy works by debt. And credit card companies that charge twenty nine point nine nine percent. You know why they do that? Because they can't charge 30 percent. There's actually a law that says you can't charge 30 percent or more. So they charge 20. Go look on the back of your credit card statement and find out. You'll see 29.99%. Okay. So uh, it's all an illusion. So what do they want to come here for? They think it's going to be better for them? No. You're, if, you're going to, if you're going to start at the bottom rung and come to the United States and think that somehow you're going to walk on golden streets, somebody's been deceiving you. Okay. Uh, The reason they want these people to come in, especially those in California, the liberal, liberal state of California, is because all that farmland they have and and which they produce, what, one eighth of the GNP of the United States, this one single state, and they're all liberal. um, And they need people to work these farms, baby. Come on. And we ain't going to pay you what? What's the going rate now in, in California? 20 bucks of an, an hour? Woo. Are you kidding? No, nah, bring those migrants over here. And we'll make sure that nobody knows about it. They'll go unidentified and, you know, without documentation. Why? Well, because we don't want them to have documentation. We want them to go work in the fields like they used to. So they become slaves. And all the while, these poor immigrants are told, oh, you're going to live the American dream. Come to America. It's much better than Mexico. Okay? I don't see anybody starving in Mexico. I really don't. I've been to Mexico many times. You know, they've got their good points and bad points like every other. But I don't see anybody starving. Okay? So, (laughs) something's not right. Something is just not right. And now they become, these migrants become the suffering flesh of Christ. So now he puts a guilt trip on the, on all Catholics. Okay. Unless you see it the way I see it, then you're not worshiping Christ. It's such bull crap. It really is. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'm ashamed you know, to, to say, I follow this Pope. Because when it comes to this kind of stuff, it's just, all right, let me see what else I have here. Uh, Camden Diocese. Just paid out $87.5 million in sexual abuse cases where the priest has been convicted. 
87.5 million. Um, so it's still, it's still going on. So there are there are demons in this world, and you know there's a passage what in Apocalypse nine it says God let out two hundred million demons at one time, and that's you know that's relevant for our day. Um, and then this Cardinal Dolan, my goodness, what an embarrassment he is. He's like he's like a Kamala Harris of Catholic Church. You know how Kamala Harris is just constantly laughing. I mean, she can't hold a straight face. Now, I don't know whether that's just because she's got a good sense of humor or that she's just so nervous or she doesn't really have a lot of knowledge. So in order to cover that up, she sort of just laughs it off. You know, it gets everybody else laughing and gets them not concentrating on her, but, you know, having a good joke. Maybe that's the way she deals with people. I don't know what, what her M.O. is. But Cardinal Dolan is like the same thing. He'll be on TV and you'll watch him. And within a minute, he's laughing at something. You know, hoo, 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 you know, talking. And, and the, the reporter, whoever it is, NBC, ABC, whatever, is trying to be serious, asking serious questions. Well, <laughs> you know, and. Uh, the guy has a problem. He really does. Got a problem. And um, yeah, I saw him interviewed about a year or so ago on NBC. Is, is in, in New York, of course. It's right down the street from the cathedral. Um, and I, I was ashamed to be a Catholic at that point in time. I just went, this is, is our leadership? You know? I mean... Where do they get these guys from? And our seminaries and our universities are just on the brink of apostasy. I mean, did you see the, the, the new commentary that the Catholics put out? The commentary for the 20, the new Jerome commentary for the 21st century? Oh my God. What a piece of crap that thing is. It's what? It looks like it's about 1,500 pages. And I'm going to write a commentary on the commentary myself. And I'm finally going to get around to it, it looks like. Um, but it is one of the most blasphemous, anti-biblical, anti-Catholic treatises I have ever seen written by those who purport to call themselves Catholic. I mean, um, I've always told you that the new Catholicism, whenever it started, who knows? Um, we know it's gotten worse, that's for sure. But they don't believe that the Bible's inspired anymore. Okay? And the first thing that you will do when you see my book on my commentary on this commentary is what the commentary does with 2 Timothy 3.16, which says all scriptures inspired by God and profitable for training in righteousness, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And so they change the translation and try to defend it from some idiot who doesn't know his Greek. And uh, it says now, what is it? Um, every scripture inspired by God is profitable for in other words there are scriptures that aren't inspired in fact most of them aren't and the and they come up with this new rule well the only ones that are inspired are the ones that talk about salvation that's the new rule that they've made based on their fallacious interpretation of de verbum 11 at vatican II. and de verbum 11 says the scripture is inspired for the sake of your salvation. So these idiots took the phrase for, for the sake of our salvation and said, oh, that means that scripture is inspired when it talks about salvation. 
how could anyone who's got two two brain cells take that statement all scripture is inspired for the sake of our salvation and twist it to mean that only scripture that talks about salvation is inspired by god i have never seen anything so twisted in all my life and it wasn't backed up by vatican ii at all because vatican ii has five footnotes dave verbum they documents five footnotes attached to this paragraph and not one of them says oh by the way uh we mean that only scripture that talks about salvation is, is inspired by god nowhere Nowhere in all the teaching of the Catholic Church for the last 2,000 years has that interpretation ever even seeped to the surface, except in the mind of the liberal Catholics, who somehow think they have the uh, license to change anything they don't like. Isn't that what a liberal is? They can't live by the rules. They just, you know, we don't like this because he did this and that, dee, 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 dee. and so they change the rules. That's what a liberal does. He thinks he has a liberality to go change the rules because he doesn't like the way they sit with him. Not in this time of day, you see. Yeah. So um, that's how they start out this commentary. Okay which means that every other passage they go and examine, especially from the Old Testament, okay? Because unless it's prophetic, it has nothing really to say about salvation proper, that is, okay? Um, even the New Testament, sometimes it's not talking about salvation. It's talking about history, you know, or um, a parable, or the apocalypse, or Paul's, you know, shipwreck in Acts 27, or, uh, you know, they're all, there's history all over the New Testament. And only in certain sections is it talking about salvation. And these guys say, oh, yeah, well, those are the only places that are inspired by God. All the other places are just written by men, and we know they're prone to error. And we're going to tell you all the errors they made, because we know what the truth is. They didn't. Because they were all primitive. He's primitive. You know, they didn't have much knowledge like we do. Today, that's the ploy. So when they talk about homosexuality and how sinful it is back in the in the New Testament, okay, there's about a half a dozen places that it does that. Well, you see, that's first of all, it's not about salvation. It's about culture. Okay. So that means it's not inspired by God. It's just the opinion of the writer. So when Paul condemns homosexuality in Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 6 and, and uh, 2 Peter does uh, Peter doesn't, 2 Peter chapter 2, and Jude does it, and Paul does it in Galatians. Well, you see, that's just their opinion because it wasn't about salvation. Okay, so, but we're way beyond St. Paul today, you see, because we we have come into knowledge that, oh, the homosexuality, that's caused by uh, the genes you got. You see, it's not your problem. Somebody gave it to you. So you're just living out your natural life. See, we know that now. See, Paul didn't know about genes and chromosomes and all that stuff. That's what they do. And that's where this new commentary is coming from. And you see it almost, almost every page. It's a disgusting piece of crap is what it is. I, I, I am just ashamed that the Catholic Church could put out garbage like this. Oh, and they all got their THDs and their PhDs, and they all teach at these you know, secular universities or even Catholic universities, and they're all... You know, they get on TV and they write articles for magazines. They all think they're so hot. And yet they don't even know what the gospel is. They really don't know what the gospel is. Okay, so, I mean, 
I hate to start out with such a negative. Uh, let me get to these um, email questions here. Let me see. Um, oh, this is one I didn't get to last week. It says, Robert, I hope you're feeling better. I have another question for your Wednesday live show. The other day I saw the sun in the western sky and a half moon in the eastern sky. And I wonder, why is the moon not full? Let me get this right. I saw the sun in the western sky, okay, and half and a half moon in the eastern sky. And I wonder why is the moon not full? Because I can see no object between the sun and the moon to cause a shadow. Okay, yeah, sometimes it will look like that. And um, there are several reasons for that. Um, one is in order to get a full moon, the sun is going to have to be at 180 degrees. Oh, it can't be like, you know, 160 or 130. Okay. It's got to be exactly at 180 degrees. So, uh, and if you don't have 180 degree separation between the sun and the moon, you're going to not see a full moon. You're going to see something less than a full moon. Okay. The other thing is that the moon has an, uh, it, it uh, revolves around the earth every 27, 28 days. Okay. So it's got an independent movement from the sun and the stars. That's another issue, by the way. But it's on a five degree um, plane of variation. Okay. So, in other words, here's a straight plane okay now if there's a five degree deviation that means that plane is going to be like that okay so the the circle of this of the moon's orbit can vary by five degrees either way so that's going to be a 10 degree difference okay and that changes from month to month okay so um that's going to be another issue that you have to take into account. So though it may look like the sun is, you know, on the other side of the world, so to speak, it may not be exactly. And that's going to make all the difference in the world. Okay. And that's why we don't have eclipses all the time. Now we're going to have one on um, April the 8th, a total eclipse that's going to go from, say, Texas up to Maine. It's going to make a curve up, up to Maine. It's going to go right by Arkansas, Tennessee, uh, Kentucky. Yeah, that's the path it's going to take. Okay. Now, we only have, um, what is it? The most total eclipses we can have in a year is five. There's going to be two at any given year, but whether there's going to be more than two depends on where the moon and the sun are in their cycles. But even then, you can only have at most five, and that's only going to be at 0.5% of the time. Okay. Most of them are not going to be total eclipses. They're going to be partial eclipses. And uh, so this is one of those days. The last one we had was um, 2017. And that turned out to be a little dud. Everybody thought it was going to be so spectacular, and it wasn't. Uh, it's just like the comets that they've been saying, you know, uh, Kahootek and um, Halley's Comet, you know. They all turn out to be duds. They're not as spectacular as, as they make them out to be. Uh, unless you got the super powerful telescope to watch them, okay, you're not going to see much. Um, so, oh, and that brings up an issue. I, I had to deal with it all this morning. Total waste of time, except um, I think it helped a lot of people. Somebody sent me a thing about the comet and all the predictions, apocalyptic predictions that they were making. And, you know, such stupid stuff like the the uh, the apocalypse, I'm sorry, the eclipse of April 8th, 2024 
is exactly 6,666 days from the last eclipse, total eclipse that we had in the United States. <laughs> Even if that were true, it's like, so what? I mean, there, there's one place where the Bible makes a big deal about the number 666, okay? But this is not even 666. This is 6,666, okay? So right off the bat, something's wrong. And then you go and check the number, and it's not 6,666. It's 6,600 and... Um, 67 plus one, or uh, yeah, six, 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 seven, eight, or something like that. Point eight, um, because you have to include the leap years and you have to get the exact figure. Um, because if half a day, half a year is 182.5 days, not 182, not 183, so you have to consider all that. And when you come out the other end, it's not 6,666. But they were making a big deal like, oh, this is this is the time of judgment for the United States, blah, blah, blah. Hey, our judgment is long overdue. It's only the long suffering of God that has held it back this long. And, and who knows how long he's going to, you know, Mary's going to hold up God's arms like Moses had his arms held up uh, until Aaron couldn't hold them up anymore. And, um, uh, who knows when that's going to be. But they had all this silly stuff, um, 12 points based on the eclipse and what that means in judgment. Like um, the, the eclipse is going to go over eight cities named Nineveh from Texas to Maine. Okay. So, oh, wow, Nineveh. And then it says Nineveh in parentheses, judgment. Because Jonah went to Nineveh, remember, and preached the gospel and said they were going to be judged in 40 days unless they repented. Okay. So it's, it's some big deal that the path of the eclipse is going to go over eight cities called Nineveh. So then you go examine this and you find out, no, that's not the case at all. There's only two cities named Nineveh. Uh, I forget where they are. Wisconsin was one of them. I'm not sure. Anyway, so there's only two out of the eight. So it's not as spectacular as they're trying to make it. And then they below that one, they say that there are um, many places named Salem along. They don't give the number, but there's many places named Salem along the path of the eclipse. And Salem means peace. So I was like, oh, okay, so we got judgment from Nineveh and we got peace from Salem. And that's supposed to mean something. They don't tell you what that's supposed to mean, except implying that the United States is going to be judged like Nineveh was judged. Well, actually, Nineveh wasn't judged because they repented. Um, but, um, and they said, and they make this claim that there was a, a solar eclipse at the very time that Jonah preached to the Ninevites. No, we don't know that. We think there could have been one near that time, or it could have been near the, the city because there's eclipses every year. Okay. Not just the United States, they're all over the world. And um, so you can't prove that, but this is the, the kind of thing they're kind of draw. This is apocalyptic sensationalism based on this eclipse coming up. People, all it is, is an eclipse. They occur all the time. Okay. Um, what was it? They were trying to, Oh, so go back to the Salem. There are 32 cities in the United States with the name Salem, okay? Most of them are not even near the path of the solar eclipse, okay? So what do you... Uh, what else were they saying? Um, there is... Um, the last eclipse was... The last total eclipse was... Uh, August 17th, 2017. And if you connect the, the path of that eclipse with the uh, path of the eclipse that's going to occur on April the 8th, it makes an X. 
okay? Because one of them is going this way and the other one's going that way, and it makes an X. And that X is over the, um, the area of um, volatility, earthquake volatility. What's it called? New something. But it's somewhere like near Kentucky, Tennessee, okay? Um, and that X is right over the that area, the volatile area. It's the most volatile area in the eastern, what, I guess, what, east of the Mississippi? I don't even know if I can say that because, um, you know, California, Oregon, Washington, that's all, you know, hot, a hot mess because there's fault lines everywhere. And in this one place, right above Texas and uh, east of Arkansas, near Georgia and all, there's this, there's this place where it is also also has a lot of fault lines. Okay. And they say, and they make a big deal. They say, well, see, you put that these two eclipses together, the one from 2017 and the one from 2024, and it's an X right over this volatile fault line area. Like, so what? And then if you go and look at it and you see where the X really is, it's, it's west of the, the the x is actually west of the um supposed fault area okay by the by the width of the state of arkansas okay so it doesn't go right over it even if that would mean something okay so this is the kind of sensationalism that you got to watch out for a big and and who's the biggest producer of this TikTok? Okay, no wonder we have all these uh, congressmen, and everybody upset about TikTok because this is the kind of garbage that they're sending into the American mind. Okay, but your country is going to be under judgment, and here's the proof of it. This ecliptical path uh, or eclipse path goes over your fault line. Wow. Okay. And then there's other stuff that's even stupider than what I just explained to you. Like the cicadas. The cicadas are coming at the same time in 2024. Uh, see, I grew up with cicadas because I grew up on the East Coast, like many of you have. And you knew from your experience and your studies that the cicadas come every 17 years like clockwork okay and sometimes they even come th every 13 years okay but you knew when you heard that e -e 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 there's cicadas out there millions of them and then they die and they don't come back for 17 years and you wonder where where did they go okay but that's just a phenomena of nature but they, not these guys, man. We we got to make something of this. The cicadas are coming this year, and that and that it's the same time as the eclipse. And well, that's some kind of apocalyptic message that God's trying to give us. No, okay, no, 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 no. When God gives you a message, it's going to be unmistakable. Okay, like Fatima, that was unmistakable, and we still flub that up. Okay, so anyway, it's out there in email land. I sent it to a bunch of people. Maybe you'll run into it. But um, all right, let me read uh, another email question here. Uh, can you discuss when and how the church had police powers? <laughs> I often hear from skeptics that the church had people killed, was brutal, etc., it would be good to have an explanation of real history here. Well, they did. You know, they, they, uh, you have the, uh, what do they call that? The, uh, the one, the, the guard that protects the Pope now. What is that called? Um, um, I forget. And they, they have this fancy dress that they wear. Not dress. They don't wear a dress. They wear fancy clothes that are um, have an interesting pattern and colors to them. I forget what they're called. Um, 
that's the remnants of what the church used to have as their police force. Okay. The church has an interesting history here because, um, you know, they fill the vacuum of the Roman Empire back in the, in the what? Fourth century. Rome fell and wow, what a vacuum was left. And the church had survived the persecutions of the Roman emperors for three centuries. And then comes the fourth century. And Ro who could have predicted it? Rome falls and the church more or less takes over. And uh, if there are kings and emperors, well, there are working with it. They are working with the church. And it's an interesting little combination that's there because the Pope won't do anything unless he has the King's approval and the King won't do anything unless he has the Pope's approval. So it's an interesting symbiosis that they have going all throughout the middle ages. And you figure the way psychologically that it's working is considering men are evil. Okay. Now the seculars are probably a little bit more evil than the church is God uses one against the other. And he's been doing that ever since. Um, Israel, he used one against the other. You know, Babylon, he used against Israel when Israel sinned. Um, when Assyria sinned, they took the northern tribes. God used Babylon against them, against the Assyrians. Okay. Okay. When the, the Babylonians took the Judah into captivity for seven years, after that, God used Persia against the Babylonians. Okay? So this is the history of the world, is that God uses one against the other because he doesn't trust any of them. Okay? He doesn't trust any of them. And he'll use one against That's why it says he's no respecter of persons. Well, he's no respecter of nations either. He'll use one against the other. And this gives a, um, a peace in the world, okay? You know, like we have all these atomic bombs, right? Well, so does Russia, so does China, so does India, okay? And what does that do? Well, that's the mutual mad theory, mutual destruction. If somebody decides to push the red button, you push the red button against somebody else, you can bet your bottom dollar it's going to come back to bite you within about 24 hours or less, because they're going to bomb you, and it's over, okay? So somehow, some way, that's been a good deterrent, and God allows that. That's why he wants nations, and not one nation, because if you have one nation, well, who are they going to answer to? There's nobody else out there. That's why we wouldn't want the one world government. We want nations with their own sovereignty. Why? Well, because they all check each other. And they don't let anybody get away with anything. Monetarily or what, politically, whatever. Look at how the United States has to fight against Russia and China. And that's God's purpose. He wants them there so that they check each other. So that one doesn't get too powerful, you see. But that's what the United States wants to do. Oh, they, they want all the power. That's where that's why they're in 192 countries. You know, that's that's what they thought ever since the Industrial Revolution and then the end of World War II, that they were going to rule the world. And they soon found out that, oh, there's other nations out there that maybe not as, you know, uh, financially stable. Well, of course, we got $30 trillion of debt. I don't know how you can be stable with that. But at least we can make our own money because we're the reserve currency, you see. Uh, but God allows the China, Russia, whoever it is, to, it's like pawns on a chessboard. That's what he's doing. And these guys don't have the slightest idea. They think they're the ones pushing the levers. They're not. Okay? It's all in God's control. He puts this pawn here and that pawn there and that queen here and, and all that. Like a big giant chess game. And he uses one nation against the other. He uses one person against the other. Because as I said, he can't trust anybody. He can't trust anybody. 
That's the nature of man. And so this is what God has to resort to. Okay. So the Catholic Church, uh, same thing. You know, the Romans were conquered. The church came in and had a lot of authority, a lot of pull, a lot of political authority, a lot of money was coming in. Okay. And so, um, you know, they would get too big for their britches. And um, by the 600s, um, the Muslims came along. And guess what? By a couple hundred years later, they were str pretty strong, the Islamic nations. And whenever the church got too big for her britches and started sinning and doing things they shouldn't have done, guess what? God brought the Muslims in. Yeah. Go, go watch the history of Europe, uh, say from 600 all the way to 1600. And you'll see that it goes back and forth, back and forth. You know, the church gets a little uppity and God brings the Muslims along and punishes them. And then the church cleans up its act and, you know, pushes away the Muslims. Back and forth it goes. It must have happened three or four times in the Middle Ages, probably half a dozen times. Okay, why? Well, yeah, it's his church, but he can't even trust the people in his church because they're men just like everybody else. And they're going to mess up and they're going to take advantage of their power. And um, look at the church today. OK, you don't need much proof. Men are men. They do what they do. And the God's got to use somebody else to check them down and to punish them whenever it's appropriate. Whether it's the church or a secular nation doesn't make any difference, okay? So, um, so the church, you know, in in the sense of having the whole doctrine of making people obey the marriage laws, obey you know whatever moral command that the church put out there, yeah, the church could you know use a so-called police force if you want to call it that. I mean, even in Jewish times, they the Levites were the police of the Jews. So this is nothing new, uh, especially in Paul's day when he's dealing with the, um, the Jews of his day who were just refusing to accept Christ. The Sanhedrin is in control, but they have the Levitical police force. And this was the police force that was with St. Paul when he did his uh, persecuting of Christians gathering up Christians and bringing them to, to jail, making them, uh, you know, sit in jail until a supposed trial would come up where they would be accused of blasphemy. He got the Levitical police to help him gather up these Christians. He didn't do it by himself. Okay, so the church had something similar to that. Okay, and, um, you know, the Inquisition was part of that. It wasn't just a doctrinal thing. It, they had power of the sword, okay? And if it wasn't them, then they got the, the Pope got the secular government to get involved. That's what happened to Giordano Bruno, okay? The church convicted him of the doctrinal aberrations, and then the secular government came in and burned him at the stake. And both were involved in that, you know? Uh, it's, it's very hard for the church to clean their hands on that one and say, oh, well, it's all the secular people's fault. No, they knew what the setup was. Okay. Um, it, reformers were killed uh, by the Catholic Church. Okay. Uh, and you, somebody could make the argument that, oh, well, the Ch Catholic Church has the right to do this because, um, you know, Israel had that right. Whenever they had a false prophet, they would stone him to death. You know, well, what's more of a false prophet in the, uh, you know, 500 years ago than someone who wouldn't obey the Pope and considered uh, salvation, you know, by faith alone or didn't agree with indulgences or whatever the case may be. And we're letting people get divorced and remarried, which is against Catholic uh, law. Uh, so you had a lot of illegitimate marriages out there. You know, what do you do with these leaders? Okay, so, I mean, you can put them in prison or kill them, okay? And you can justify that, okay? 
But sooner or later, the church realized that um, it wasn't her domain to act in the ways that the secular government alone should act, and that there should be some kind of separation. And we could base that on, uh, say, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul catches a man, a young man probably, who is um, sleeping with his stepmother. And um, Paul says, get this guy out of here. Okay, turn his flesh over to the secular authorities, basically. Excommunicate him for this sin and then turn his flesh over to the secular authorities and see what they do with it. Okay, so there was an implied limit on what the church could do, even though it could have their own guard and protect itself, you know, um, there was limits to that. And we already began to see the overspill or the, what you would call the, uh, the uh, overkill or um, the um, exaggeration, whatever, in the um, Crusades. Okay, here you got the Catholic Church led by some saints killing people left and right to go to Jerusalem to save. Jer What's Jerusalem? Jerusalem is no longer in the in the game. Okay, uh, it's Rome and all the uh, cities out there that are getting the gospel. Um, the only reason you would even think of saving Jerusalem is because. There's Christians there, okay? Uh, but by that time, you know, there were not a lot of Christians in Jerusalem, okay? So the question, what what is Jerusalem in your thinking here? And so Jerusalem somehow became symbolic of Catholicism. You know, we had to protect Jerusalem because it's Catholic. Um, no, that's not the way it works, Okay. So the whole idea of the Crusades, we're going to go save Jerusalem. And meanwhile, you're killing people left and right there and before you get there. Um, that's not Christianity. It's not Christianity. Okay. But this is what happens when the church somehow becomes very prominent and the sort of the safe place to be in all the commotion that's out there in the nation, somehow the church thinks it's, you know, the top dog now, and it can wield power left and right without being um, checked by anybody, okay? That can happen in the church. And by the time we get to the, you know, 1700s, 1800s, um, the secular world has gotten pretty big now, and they're getting tired of the Catholic church pushing them around politically monetarily and um, land-wise um, so that now the, um, the papal states become a threat to the rest of the world. And the papal states were a sort of a symbol of the church's power over the secular world other than spiritual. You see, because if you own land that you're now using for political purposes and not spiritual, because like it's okay for the church to own land in the sense that, you know, we're going to build a church here. This is our land. And we're, we're, we're hoping that the secular government protects us and we're going to have worship here. Okay. That's good use of land. But if you use now land for political purposes, warfare to help a king um, overcome you can he can use your land as a you know spying or build armaments or whatever he wants to do and he pays you money for that okay well, now you're getting involved okay you're becoming just like the rest of the world okay is that what God wants okay yeah you can own land but not use it like the world uses their land. And, um, you know, so things can go haywire, okay? 
so, you know, the church has to be kept in line just like the secular governments have to be kept in line. We're not any better except that we have the sacraments, we have the gospel, and that's not powerful in the worldly sense. If anything, they think it's a weakness. Okay? So <laughs> it's not going to do anything for us. So we got to be real careful here. And, um, you know, look at Israel back in the Old Testament. Why, why do we look to, to Israel? Why is the Old Testament so big? Yeah, it's about four times the size of the New Testament or, or more. Why? And you read all those stories back there. How are they relevant? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, he says it two times. Those stories were written for you upon whom the ends of the ages has come. For you, so that you can know not to do what they did. Okay? And what did they do? You know, they had they came out of Egypt to worship golden calf, of course, and then that messed everything up. And then they had the judges, and um, they uh, yeah, what did they want? They wanted to become like the world. Yeah, we want a king just like the world has kings. You know, so our our king can go to their king and shake hands and pat each other on the back and make deals, and you know, we feel much better with that arrangement. And, 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 and God says to Samuel, don't worry. Let them have their little king. Because basically what's happening is they're rejecting me. I can't be their king. And that hurt God very much. And so they had their kings. And then what did these kings do? Well, the first king, well, David, of course, he got, got himself into moral trouble. And his life was never the same. And then his son, Solomon, that he had through this adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, a foreigner. <laughs> uh, at the end of his life, he apostatizes and has, what, 700 concubines, 300 wives, and started worshiping all the gods of where his wives came from. And according to 1 Kings 11, he totally apostatized from the faith. So that's what the nations will do to you, okay? They'll put pressure on you, and you got to hold out and, and be pure and spiritual and know what your purpose is, because if you start thinking that your purpose is to go out and conquer the world on a political or military or whatever financial level, you got the wrong place, buddy, the wrong place. And there's a lot of organizations like that in Catholicism today. Like Opus Dei, for example, you know, Latin for work of God. All they're interested in is making money. Yeah, it's all they're interested in is making a lot of money, becoming real powerful. And they're going to hell in a handbasket. Okay, because that is not their purpose. As soon as you see that that's what's controlling you, you're not following God anymore. The Legionaries of Christ. Here's another one. Led by um, uh, Father Maciel. Yeah, and then found out that he was a total pervert and was just sucking in young people to make more money for himself that he you could shake a stick at. Yeah, and that was just what? Um, 20 years ago. And they're still going, the Legionaries of Christ. And Regnum Christi. They're all about making money. And they don't know God from a hole in the ground. Okay? And there's there's more of these apostolates coming along. Um, you know, it's just... Uh, at any rate, um, yeah, the church did have their police force, so to speak. And, and then I showed you the dangers of all that because you become too involved with the world. And as time went on, God took that all away. He even took the papal states away. And now all we have is a Vatican city state. That's its own country, has its own guard, and, you know, they'll protect the Pope. They're not going to do, they're not going to take up arms and go out and fight, you know, uh, Mussolini 
or whoever is in leading Italy. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, see, but then we have the problem with the Vatican Bank and getting their hands dirty with all the mafia money, the P2 money, and um, even one of our popes probably was assassinated because he saw what was going on and wanted to stop it. That's Pope John Paul I. Okay? Uh, so you see how easy it is for the church. You have your police force, and, and you forget what your purpose is. Your purpose is not to make a lot of money. Your purpose is to divest yourself with uh, of as much money as possible and leave enough to survive. And that's you fulfilled your purpose. But when you have power, oh boy, absolute power corrupts absolutely, whether it's the church or the government or anything anywhere in between. Okay. All right. Uh, I read your paper that the last authoritative statement by the church on geocentrism was given during the time of Galileo. The church uh, held that he was vehemently suspect of heresy, thus affirming the heliocentrism was or is a heresy. I read your excellent paper, and this makes perfect sense. However, why then did Pope John Paul II, I think it was him, you're right, it was him, give that speech to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, affirming his belief in a non-geocentric universe. Wasn't he aware of the church's stance on this? Well, see, their whole purpose for, for organizing what in 1981, what the Pope called the Galileo Estudianti, that is to study the issue and to figure out what really went on there, okay, with these popes and Galileo back in the 1600s. And he hired all that he could hire to come on the commission, and they were all the liberals of the church. Do you think there was any conservatives there that John Paul could have tapped and say, hey, uh, you want to be part of this commission here to go study the Galileo issue? Do you think there were any conservatives there? Even if there were, they wouldn't be picked because the head guy, Cardinal Pupar of France, um, wouldn't take them, Okay. And he's the one who wrote the speech for the for the Pope <coughs> in 1992. And so they went to study this. And what was their conclusion? This commission that studied it. Well, here was their, their conclusion. He, he said they made their mistake because they believed that the Bible had to be interpreted literally. And so when they came across a passage that says the earth does not move and the sun revolves around the earth, they thought they had to take it literally. Well, golly, I wonder where that came from. They had to take the Bible literally? You mean like when Jesus said, this is my body, take and eat? And the Catholic Church said, wow, Jesus said that that must be literally true. And therefore, we have the Eucharist today. You mean that kind of literal? <clears throat> yeah, that's where they were getting it from. The whole church, the whole Catholic Church had a tradition, a legacy of taking Scripture literally, even though it seemed impossible to do, and then figure out how to explain it later, which Thomas Aquinas helped us do on the Eucharist. But what was the decision of the church? Because they were tempted to say, hey, I mean, if there's ever an opportunity to say that a passage was symbolic, it's this one where Jesus says, here, take and eat. It's my body. And we know he's going to go to the cross and his body's going to be on the cross and it's going to suffer and die. All right. So why can't that bread that they're munching on be symbolic of that incident at the cross. Doesn't that make sense? Sure does. You know, unless you have a religion where people are munching on the body, and, and I use that word munching deliberately, 
because that's the word that's used in John chapter 6, verse 54. Jesus says, unless you munch on my body, it doesn't use the word eat there. Okay? The, the word eat is estheo. The word munch or chew is trogo. That's what Jesus says four times in John 6. Unless you munch on my body to let them know that he's talking about something that may be not symbolic. Okay? Because how do you munch on something symbolically? Um, yeah, that's where our uh, legacy is. How about with baptism? Unless a man is baptized with this water and the spirit, he cannot get into the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> what do you think, folks? Is that a good place to interpret symbolically instead of literally? I mean, come on. I'm going to drink some water here. What power does that water have? None. So why don't I just interpret it symbolically? <laughs> just say it's water's like, you know, washing my sins away symbolically. Man, that's easy. Okay? Are you going to make us look stupid and interpret that literally? Like the water has to do something? Well, that's what the church did. Okay? And so this idiot... Cardinal Pupar is saying that the popes of the 1600s shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have taken the Bible literally. And yet we have a precedent for 1600 years prior where that's all the church did was take scripture literally. So who's got the problem here? Well, they have the problem. Cardinal Pupar and his entourage because they think that science has proved that the earth does move. They're all convinced. I mean, come on, you got guys like Galileo and Newton and, you know, I mean, that's all we need. All we need is an equation. Just one equation, that's all we need. Hey, you win. Okay? And that's why... The commentary that we talked about earlier, commentary, the New Jerome commentary, um, why does it say that Scripture is not inspired anymore? Well, because that means we'd have to read Psalm 93 when it says that the earth doesn't move, that the earth really doesn't move. And, and, we, and we know that's not the truth, because that's what Newton told us. Oh, Newton. Oh, wow, the guy that was a member of no church and that made up things that uh, uh, came to his mind willy-nilly without the slightest proof. Huh? Oh. So, all right, so did I answer your question? Yeah, that's where it's all coming from, okay? So, Lord Jesus, come back anytime you want. Because we're ready for you. All right. Let me get to the uh, question box here. See what's on your mind today. All right. So he says, is he taking chat questions? <laughs> oh, my God. I went on preaching mode today, didn't I? An hour and 15 minutes. Oh, well. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Question. When the devil tempts Jesus, he says he can offer any kingdom. Does this mean there's not a single kingdom? nation the devil doesn't control um well yes and no i mean he's always under god's control okay um what the devil means here is the kingdoms that can be seen from the pinnacle that jesus was on okay it does not mean the whole world here okay so um the these are the kingdoms that you know the devil says he can give and um you know that's true, that he could do that. And that's why it served as a temptation to Jesus, because if it wasn't true, then it would be no temptation. Jesus could have figured that out, okay? So, um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. 
how is it that scripture is written with such detail, included, including quoting word for word what Christ said, as if the authors were direct witnesses, if it was written years after the events? Okay, so what would happen is the way inspiration works, is that, let's take Luke, for example. Uh, Luke is the only gospel writer that um, talks about the um, impregnation of Mary, except Matthew in, in, in other ways, about the Annunciation, about Zachariah, John the Baptist, you know, that stuff that, uh, as a baby, John the Baptist as a baby, um, you know, that he, he moved in his mother's womb and uh, the salutation of Mary and, you know, all kinds of details like that, that you get for the first, what, three chapters of Luke that you don't get in the other Gospels. So the question is, how did Luke know this? Okay. Well, um, he knew Mary after Jesus died. Uh, he knew Zachariah. He knew them all. He talked to them. He went to talk to them. And he got a word-for-word -word description of what happened. Okay? And, and then when he went to write it, the Holy Spirit comes upon him and makes sure every word is correct. There's no mistake Luke makes. Okay? Like, you know, it says, John moved in his mother's womb at six months old. Well, how would Luke know that? <laughs> How would he know that it was six months, not four months, not uh, five months, but six months? Okay, so that's where the inspiration comes. Now, he could have gotten that information from Elizabeth, you know, that she was in the sixth month. Just she's counting the days, of course. And he talks to her and finds out it's six months that John moved in her womb. Okay, so that's all possible. And then to bring that to uh, writing, the Holy Spirit is going to take that information that Luke knows and work however he works to make that six months, not seven months, not five months. Okay? That's how inspiration works. We get the information, the person gets the information, and then when it's put to writing, the Holy Spirit makes sure there's no error there. Okay? And they become the words of God. That's what scripture is, the words of God. Uh, let's take the book of Acts, for example. Um, all the detail that is put in there. Luke wrote the book of Acts. And we have him, Paul's going to this city and that city and this city and that city. And by the time he's done, he's got like, you know, 15 different cities he's visited. And he has 15 different experiences. Same with Peter. He, he is not as active as, as Paul is, but he's active, and he goes from place to place, and Luke's counting all that and writing it all down. Well, how is that possible? Because you'll read in the book of Acts, sometimes uh, Luke will say, and we went to blah, blah, blah. You know, We went to Corinth, or we went to Galatia. Well, who's the we? Well, it's Luke. That's the only way you can make it plural, okay? Which means what? That Luke followed Paul from city to city, wherever he went. Why? Well, because he was commissioned by Theophilus, according to Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, to write an accurate rendition of what happened with Jesus and the apostles. And Luke guaranteed, he actually uses the word guaranteed, that I will guarantee that I will give you an accurate account of what happened with Jesus and the apostles. And that's what we see in, in Luke's gospel in the book of Acts. Okay. So that's how it's done. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them to make sure that no error appears in the written word, uh, whatever they're writing on. Papyri, vellum, whatever it is that they're writing on at that time. Okay, so, all right. And it's not many years after, by the way. Okay. I mean, Luke's taking notes right on the spot, wherever he goes with Paul. Okay. 
you know, like in Acts 27, there were 276 sailors or, or men who were on the boat. And where did he get that number from? He counted them. Okay? That's how he did it. He counted them. And he's with them on that boat when it's sailing and when it crashes. Okay? So that's how he knows all those details. So he's taking notes right on the scene. Okay? Because he's got a job to do. He was commissioned to do the job, and I'm sure he was paid for it. Theophilus was some kind of leader at that time, and um, he had some money. And um, so I think I answered your question, and uh, so I'll go on to the next one. All right, Deuteronomy 2.25. This seems to apply to present-day Jews, defined as the people who reject Christ. Even Bibi and the ADL would agree. But is it Catholic? But is it Catholic? I'm not sure what you mean by that. You mean, is it legit? Uh, let me look at Deuteronomy 2.25. Two twenty-five. This very day I will begin to put the terror and fear of you on all the nations under heaven. They will hear reports of you and will tremble and be in anguish because of you. Um, your, uh, your question is, this seems to apply to the present day Jews defined as the people who reject Christ. Um, if you compare it to the way it applied in Deuteronomy, okay, I would say no. In Deuteronomy, the fear of God was put into the nations because Israel was going to go into the land of Canaan and destroy all those wicked cities. We've been waiting 400 years for this to happen. It finally happens. Israel uh, survives their own sins as a, because they worshiped a golden calf, went through the desert for 40 years. They survived their own sins somehow. And now God's ready to bring judgment against the other nations who are even more wicked than the Jews. That's how it happens. Poor, poor God. <laughs> what does he have to work with? Oh, my goodness. Um, anyway, so the fear of God is put into these nations. And, um, you know, because once you accomplish a major defeat of your enemy, where you slaughter them to the point where, like, there's nobody left, men, women, children, there's nobody left, that word spreads pretty quick. Watch out for these Israelites. See, because they all had their false gods that they believed in. And if they won a victory, you know, let's say the, uh, you know, the Ninevites, they won a victory, beat up their opponent, their nation next to them. Their God was great, man. Everybody just loved this God from the Ninevites. Okay. And that's how they all uh, believed that their God was going to beat somebody else's God. And he was going to use the men to do it. Okay, the, the gods were fighting good monks one another to see who was the greatest god. But Israel had this really great god because boy, he was notorious for killing men, women, and children on the site, not leaving anything, not even even animals breathing for crying out loud. That's how vicious this god was, and that's how complete his works were. And so Israel got a reputation for being that kind of nation. And it spread far and wide. Okay, that's what Deuteronomy 2.25 is talking about. Because when you go into, like, uh, what was he? Gideon in Judges 6 goes into uh, Jericho to take it over. And God says, here's what I want you to do. Uh, I want you to, uh, first of all, he started out with 32,000 men. And God said, no, nah, too many. 
and and uh, by the time God's done with him, he gets him down to three hundred. Gideon has three hundred men, and he's going, <laughs> "How am I going to do this with just three hundred men?" And God says, "Here's here's what you do." He says you're going to go at night, and you're going to carry these lanterns. And, you know, you just light the lanterns, and you're all going to walk to Jericho, and uh, first of all, you're going to walk around seven times, okay? And um, um, I, I'm not quite sure what the purpose of that was unless the number seven is just symbolic in that case. But because you, you don't want to say that they want to get the people inside Jericho trembling by seeing the Israelites walk around seven times with their lanterns, okay? Um, but the, nevertheless, that's what they did. And because the whole idea was to surprise them. In other words, they would come in with these lanterns and the, all the people of Jericho would be sleeping. Okay. And you have 300 men and all of a sudden they make this big noise and wake all the people of Jericho up and they're like half asleep and they don't know what's going on. And they have these lanterns. They're looking at lights. They don't know who's behind the light because the light's blinding them and there's 300 of them. Of these lamps. And God says, and then you put the sword in them and you kill them right there on the spot. They don't know what's going on. They're blinded. They're this, they're that. You know, they just woke up and you kill them before they actually wake up. And there you do, you do the job. And you only need 300 to do that. <laughs> so um, that's the fear of God. See, and then, then that would travel to the next city, Ai, and then next city. And they said, did you know what the Israelites did? Oh, my gosh. What, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay, what are we going to do? Now, remember, this, this is ironic because when the Israelites were sent to spy the land before they ever went into the land of Canaan and Jericho and Ai and all the other cities, they saw giants. He said, well, these people are too big to beat up, so we got to go back. And, uh, and God says, what did I tell you? Huh? What did I tell you? And he says, okay, here's what's going to happen. For every uh, day that you searched out the land, 40 days, you're going to stay in the desert for 40 years. That's your punishment. And all you that came out of Egypt, not a one of you is going to see the land of promise that I promised Abraham 400 years earlier. Not one of you. Except Joshua and Caleb, because they obeyed me. So we have what? You know, at least 1.5 million people who came out of Egypt with the idea that, wow, we're, we're headed to the promised land. And there they lie in the desert. 1.5 million graves in the desert. So it's like, that's the fear of God. Okay. What they have in Israel today, you know, see, Luke tells us in Luke 21, the Gentiles will tread upon Jerusalem until the end of the age. And that's what's happening today, until the end of the age. Luke 21, verses 24 and 25, okay? So it's Gentile period now, and it will remain Gentile period until Jesus comes back at the second coming. That's what those verses tell us. There's no rise of Israel. There's no, um, you know, God's going to center everything around the Jews now, and Jerusalem's going to be the headquarters, and that's all bunk. That's all political nonsense created by the dispensationalists, uh, you know, the Schofield Reference Bible, all those people who don't know Jesus from a hole in the ground and interpret the Bible willy-nilly, all in favor of God's going to do great things for the Jews. No, no, no. Okay? The Bible is very clear that the Gentiles will rule until Christ comes back. And the, very, the reason we have a, a, a nation of Jews today, other than the political reasons, okay, because they wanted some place to put the Jews after World War II. 
And they weren't going to put him in Madagascar. Uh, they were going to try to put him in the land of Palestine, and they gave the Palestinians 50%, and they gave the Jews 50%. All right, so just political moves. Um, and one reason why is because, you know, um, God's still letting the world know that the Jews still are here, okay? And we're still preaching to them about accepting Jesus Christ as one last ditch effort to get these people to realize who Jesus is and what their responsibilities are. Here is the last ditch effort God's going to do. And they're not going to rule. They're not going to take over the world. No, this is this is um, like Jesus says in Matthew 24. He says, when you see the fig tree and leaf, know that I'm at the very doors. It's like a sign from God. You talk about signs. The solar eclipse is not a sign. The sign from God that he's at the very doors, ready to come back, is the fact that the fig tree is now in leaf. And we know that from his experiences with the fig tree before he went, the week before he went to the cross. He went to the fig tree to get figs, and all he saw was this lush, bright green tree with no fruit and that represented israel jerusalem big temple you know priests and sadducee every hey, they had everything sacrifices going on constantly okay they were in leaf a nation amongst the nations of the world but there wasn't a bit of fruit not one bit okay and that's what we see today we see a nation flourishing Oh, wow, they can go in there and kill whoever they want at any time they want and even snub the president of the United States. Tell him to go pound sand because they got a job to do. Okay, wow, that takes a lot of quinones to do that. Okay, so yeah, they're a nation and they've proved it. But do you see any fruit there? Not one bit. You might see a couple of Messianic Jews. Okay, and even them, most of those are Protestant. Uh, so, you know, you wonder what's really going on there. Uh, but there's basically no fruit. You think Bibi would bow to Jesus Christ? I don't think so. Okay. So they're all about the Jews and who the Jews are from, from their history. That's why they want to take over Palestine. Because they deserve the land, man. Because that's where their ancestors came from. Uh, well, that was a long time ago. Don't you think? Okay. So anyway, they can make up their own rules the way they do it. And they've been doing that for a long time. Okay, but that's what they're here for, because it's a sign that Jesus is just about to come back. And man, we can't wait. Okay, so that's about it. This is about as far as, as, as we can take it. So, all right, let me see, where else are we? Let's look at the other question. How do we prove that the church is infallible without going into circular reasoning. <laughs> well, because you have, as, as John starts out the apocalypse, he says, first you have God the Father, then you have Jesus Christ, then you have the church, and then you have John who's writing the apocalypse because he, because people were going to ask the question about John and say, who is this guy? Okay. Now he's an older man now because in 95 AD, he's, he's probably in his eighties or nineties. Who knows? Um, and he was exiled to Patmos by, um, I forget Cal Caligula. I forget who it was who put him there. And, you know, he's writing this sort of fantastic symbolic book that nobody's ever seen before. The closest we've seen to the apocalypse is Daniel, perhaps Daniel. Even Daniel is tame compared to the stuff that's in the apocalypse. Okay? And as a matter of fact, John never quotes from Daniel or Zechariah or Isaiah or Jeremiah. He's on his own. 
writing his own story. And so the question would come up, how are we expected to believe what this guy is saying? First of all, he's all by himself. Second, he is uh, writing all these fantastic things about frogs coming out of men's mouths and, you know, um, women riding the beast and she's a harlot and drinking wine and, you know, all this stuff. Where is it coming from? Can we believe that it's true? Okay. So, I mean, this guy has no authority. He's, he's on an island all by himself. <laughs> he doesn't have any authority in the church per se. Um, he had, he doesn't rub shoulders with the leaders of the world. I mean, you know, so what does John do? He starts out. There's the father. There's the son. There's the church, and there's me. That's the line of authority that he starts off with. Okay? So it goes as high up as he possibly can, right to the Father. Okay? In other words, every word that I'm going to write here is from the Father, through Jesus, through the church, to me. <clears throat> so... Hey, if you don't want to believe it, that's your choice. But I'm going to tell you, that's my chain of authority. Okay? And it's either true or not true. Now, do you think I'm going to sit here and lie to you? And be audacious to claim that line of authority? If I'm just this puny little man who... It's trapped on an island, and I have no recourse to any authorities or whatever, you know? Yeah, well, that's all I can tell you, okay? My authority comes from the Father, God Almighty, El Shaddai, all right? Can't get much higher than that, can you, okay? And now it's just a matter of belief. You either accept it or you don't. Okay. Now I'm one of the guys that was, you know, walking around with Peter and Andrew and James and all those, and they were doing miracles left and right. Read the book of Acts. I mean, it's like almost every day these guys are doing miracles. And that's where the people say, oh my, they must be from God. Yeah, I'm the guy who was hanging around then. You read my name in there a few times. Okay? So I knew all of them, was with all of them, and we got the miracles to prove it. Okay? And, you know, that's my testimony. What else can I say to you? Okay? Obviously, Jesus is not, you know, uh, a bad man. Okay? He was a good man. Did good things for people all his life. So you can't fault us there, okay? Granted, that's not proof, but that's where the miracles come in, okay? And I want to show you another miracle. I want to see visions here that no one's ever seen before, okay? So, you know, yeah, some of it's circular, but if it's true, it can be circular all at once, <laughs> you know? Just because it's circular doesn't mean it's not true. All right? <coughs> it's the world that wants proof of everything. You know, that's why the Pharisees said to Jesus, you know, he was curing people of sicknesses left and right, Jesus was. That wasn't good enough for the Pharisees. They wanted to see some grand demonstration of a miracle. <clears throat> he was raising people from the dead. It didn't make any difference. They wanted to see some, make that celestial body move from here to there, you know. Make the moon turn to green cheese or whatever. They wanted something spectacular. And Jesus was not going to give in to them, of course, because that wasn't why God sent him. God sent him to cure the sick, and raise the dead and all that, and that's it. 
and to save people. But no, the Pharisees, oh, well, no, no, we can't do that. We can't, we can't succumb to that kind of menial miracle kind of thing. You know, we need something big and fantastic. And of course, Jesus knew that if he actually did turn the moon to green cheese, they would still not believe him. He knew that ahead of time. Okay? Because it was their heart that was wrong. And as he said, there's an evil and an adulterous generation that seeks for signs. Okay. Uh, but for the people that are ready to take it by faith and a little circular reasoning, yeah, we'll do the miracles. And you know they come from God. Because you know no man that can raise people from the dead. Come on. You don't need to see the moon turn to green cheese. You know as soon as I raise someone from the dead, God is there. Okay, you know that. So you have to depend on faith now. Okay. I'm not going to bend over backwards for you. I'm just going to show you a miracle here, miracle there, and you know that I come with authority then. Don't ask for more than that. Okay. And then that's where faith comes in. I believe. It's all you have, I believe from what I've seen, what I know of you. Okay. So that's all we can do in this world. The only proof you're going to have is when you actually see Jesus at the second coming. There's your proof. Okay? All right. Did St. Jerome change the Bible with the verse, she shall crush your head? No, he didn't change it, and that's because there's an ambiguity in the Hebrew, okay? Um, because I could get into the Hebrew for you, but it wouldn't make any sense to you unless you knew the Hebrew. But in the Hebrew, um, there's an ambiguity in how you say he or she, okay? It's like... You see, because the Hebrew had consonants, no vowels. And what I mean, not that they didn't say vowels, but that they weren't written into the text. They just went by their customs and tradition of how to pronounce the Hebrew word. Okay? So if they would see a, um, a Hebrew letter... See, in, in one Hebrew letter, let me see if I can make it here. Um, here, let me do this. I will draw it for you. Okay. That is a Hebrew consonant letter, okay? Now, it's called a hey, and we would probably transliterate that as, as this, with a H-E, okay? But, It could be pronounced he, H I, instead of H E. Okay. Now the H I is feminine, H E is masculine. Okay. You're going to get this different pronunciation of this letter depending on what vowels are associated with it. But the Hebrews did not put vowels on their consonants. They only knew the, the vowels, the sounding vowels, by tradition. Okay? So that makes it difficult to translate because you don't know whether it's a he or a hey. Okay? if you don't have the vowel points. 
Now, the Masoretic text, that's the Hebrew text that we go by, has he, the masculine. Okay? But, although it's the only Hebrew text we have, it comes from the 9th century A.D. <laughs> okay? That's when the Masoretes were doing their thing. So, you got to figure, okay, is the pronunciation that they gave to this letter correct? You would most likely say, yeah, they're not going to make it up. Come on. They know the difference between he and hey. One's feminine, and one's masculine. Okay. So the odds are, yeah, they got it right. These were Jews, after all, trying to be as honest and open with the scriptures as they possibly could be okay so you if you run into an issue where you get difference between male and female well you better know what you're talking about okay especially in a verse like genesis 3 15 the first redemptive verse we have in the bible so um that's the problem here is without the vowel points, how do you know which one was correct? That's why, you know, Jerome chose the he instead of the hey. He, he figured he knew something there. And, um, you know, and this, the Septuagint was available too. Okay. And you had the Samaritan Pentateuch. And you had, um, you know, the Septuagint. So, you know. You had to make your choice. So he could have gotten it wrong. Okay? Could have gotten it wrong. He he was not under no divine protection when he did his Vulgate translation. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of mistakes in the Vulgate. Okay? Um, I mean, not a lot in the sense that it's like overwhelming. I mean... You would think that, wow, the Vulgate, you know, they, they finally, you know, there's like six editions to the Vulgate by the time we get to the 1700s, okay, because they're all correcting one another. And uh, so, and sometimes Jerome just didn't know what the answer was, okay? He was by himself. When you, when they do translations of the Bible today from the original, they have commissions of two dozen people. Okay, they're all scholars in their uh, in their fields, etymology, you know, grammar, whatever, and they're all commissioned to write a Bible translation. Here, Jerome's all by himself, living in the desert in some cave in Palestine, and 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 meanwhile, he says, and I can't help but think of dancing girls. I mean, can you imagine being under the burden of translating the whole Bible into Latin by yourself? And you have no help except if you Jews here and there, if you run into some difficulty and they're going to have, you know, 11 opinions every time you get 10 Jews together. Okay, so he's got to make the final decision. And there's one other thing I should mention about this, too. This letter, hey, um, you see that little space at the uh, top there? Right there. Um, that's called a tittle. Okay? And you remember what Jesus says, not uh, and, until every jot and tittle is fulfilled. Okay? Well, that's what the tittle is. It's this little space so that they, you don't make a complete what? square or rectangle there okay it's called a tittle and the jews the uh, jewish alphabet had a lot of those a lot of tittles um there's another letter called a tav it's the last letter of the hebrew alphabet and it looks like this Okay, so what you have is the whole 
was closed up here, okay? But now you have a tittle down here coming out the lower end, okay? It's called a tuff. The letter's called a tuff, but the thing here is called a tittle, okay? So, Hebrew lesson for today. All right. And let's see what else we got today. I am having a hard time being a PhD student in physics and cosmology. What can I do? Stick it out. Stick it out, Leonardo. Okay. You have a golden opportunity here. And here's the key. You have to know how they think. And you can only know how they think if you go through their junk, pass their tests. Okay? Then after you get your little degree, you can do anything you want. Okay? So dig deep within you. Don't give up. I mean, you're on the PhD level, which means you've already got the bas the uh, the bachelor's and the master's, I mean, unless you went from a bachelor's to PhD. But you've been through all the hard work, okay? Get that degree. I can't stress that enough to you, especially in physics, okay? Now, if you don't have the aptitude for it, because it's not easy, then, you know, that would be the only excuse. But you better be right about that and not just lazy or you don't want to go through all the work or, you know, cost too much money, whatever. No, those are all just plain bad excuses. But if you've gotten this far, bachelors, masters, come on, you know what you're doing, okay? You would not get this far unless you could do the work. You got to do it. Do whatever it takes. Eat, breathe, sleep this stuff. If you got it, if you, if that's what it's going to take. Okay. I remember my father telling me he was going through medical school. Uh, well, he, no, he had, he had to be accepted into medical school, Temple Medical School. And at that time, this is in the 50s, that physics was the weeding out um, uh, course for those who were trying to get into medical school. And my dad said he would study that stuff morning, noon, night, six days a week, every week, every month, whatever it took. He did nothing else but think physics. And it became a part of him. And he, he got an A plus on that test and he got in medical school. He told me that story probably about it two dozen times. <laughs> and I'm telling it to you. So finish. You will never regret it. Okay. A neighbor that I convinced to come back after 30 years enrolled online to be able to marry a non-Catholic couple. Wait a minute. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that's going on here. A neighbor that I convinced to come back after 30 years, I guess to the Catholic Church, enrolled online to be able to marry a non-Catholic couple Um, there's nothing you can do, Sean. <laughs> Look, you can bring a horse to water, but you know the old saying, you can't make them drink. There's all kinds of reasons people make their decisions today. You were not responsible for that. Okay? You brought her back after 30 years. Hey, your job's over. Okay? All you can do is tell her what the next series of things she should be doing according to Catholic, and that's it. If she's not going to listen, walk away. Okay? All right. Um, 
<laughs> Dear Robert, would you consider premillennial view? No. As the fathers believed, no. If not the pagan Protestant version that separates Jew and Gentile, if John is a literal vision of hell as well as symbolic, you're confusing me. <laughs> I'll just tell you, no. There's no way that I would look at the apocalypse other than symbolic. Okay? Because it's just 90% symbolic language. Okay? The numbers are symbolic. The descriptions of things are symbolic. Everything. And John lets you know that right up front. Okay? There's no surprise. It's not like reading the Gospel of John. Okay? Where everything's very straightforward. The only time you get into um, language that even comes close to John's is when Matthew, Mark, and Luke are talking about the end of the world. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. That's it. Other than parables. But we're told up front that the parables are symbolic. Okay? So, there's no way I would ever consider the premillennial view. Okay? Now, the fa early fathers made their mistake because, look, that was, the, that was the tradition, that was the legacy of the church to take everything literally. Okay? She just hadn't gotten to the apocalypse yet. Because that was a strange book. Everybody admitted it. Okay? So what do we do? Do we interpret it just like we interpreted the Eucharist in John 6 and uh, everywhere else? You know? Or is this book different? Okay? The church just wasn't ready yet to deal. They were dealing with Trinitarian problems, incarnation problems. I mean, how do you understand that Trinity three persons in one God? What does that mean? You know, and, and how are you going to separate all the other variations of that that are all heretical because they don't come to the point of truth? You know, and then the incarnation and then the Holy Spirit and the church itself, you know, they were busy trying to figure all that stuff out. And the apocalypse was the last thing on their mind. Okay? So when it came time to interpreting the apocalypse, the church had a lot more freedom, a lot more um, education, a lot more experience, four centuries worth. You know? And they were ready to tackle this book. Prior to that, no. It just didn't happen. And then they, they had competition from all the apocryphal books. There were over 200 of them out there, many of which were giving their own uh, uh, interpretation of the apocalypse, which probably affected some of these early fathers. Okay? So you've got at least a half a dozen of these apocryphal books talking about um, talking about um, you know, uh, a literal interpretation of the apocalypse. Okay? And it, it would be hard not to say that the fathers were affected by that. Okay? So you had competing views back and forth, and you did have a strain of uh, non-premillennial, which we would call amillennial, back uh, in the early centuries. Irenaeus was the first one. As a matter of fact, we don't know whether he was pre-mill or amill. Because uh, he says some things that sound like pre-mill, some things that sound like amill. Okay? But then you have other fathers that are pretty clear, you know, that there's an amillennial strain in the early fathers that we had never detected before, but now there's at least 10 of them that we found. So Augustine was not the first one nor Chrysostom, nor uh, Jerome, nor Ambrose. They were following a tradition that was already back there and now developed it. And they could develop it because there were two schools by this time. There was the Alexandrian school of exegesis, which 
was allegorized a lot of the scripture, symbolized a lot of the scripture. And they these guys went off the deep end too. Okay, because this is what happens to men. They think that if they found the key to interpretation, that they were going to somehow use that everywhere in scripture. So they begin to symbolize and allegorize things that shouldn't have been symbolized and allegorized. Jerome was famous at this. Okay. Uh, Augustine was not far behind. And, and so they went off the deep end a lot of times. What the church eventually found was that there is a balance between what's to be interpreted literally and what's to be interpreted symbolically or allegorically. And that dividing line became prophecy. Whenever the scripture talks about history, the church said that's literal. Whenever the scripture talks about prophecy, that's symbolic. Invariably symbolic. Sometimes you might get both being said at the same time, like Hosea does that. History and um, symbolic prophecy of the future. Okay. Daniel does it just a little bit. But basically, whenever you see prophecy, like Isaiah, for example, unless Isaiah specifies that he's talking about a historical prophecy, it invariably refers to something in the far future. Jeremiah is the same way. Ezekiel is the same way. Twelve minor prophets is the same way, especially Zechariah. Okay? So you got to be real careful here because Scripture is its not easy. It's not easy. But at least you have the parameters where you know when it's talking history, it's literal. When it's talking prophecy, it's symbolic. That's why the amillennial interpretation is the correct interpretation. Okay? One of the main reasons for that is that it talks about the binding of Satan. Okay? Now, if there's anything in Scripture that's pretty clear is when Satan was bound, and it's not the future. There is no information in Scripture about Satan being bound in the future. But there's plenty of information about him being bound at the cross. I mean, John 12, 31, John 16, 11, Hebrews 2, 13, 2 Peter 2, 4, Jude 6, Colossians 2, 13, and 14. Um, it's just replete, Luke 10, 18, replete with information. And those are just like a percentage of the passages that talk about Satan losing his control at the cross. Okay? Uh, and if there's anything where Scripture points us, it's like saying, look at this, look at this, look at this. That's it. And so once you understand that it starts at the first coming of Christ, Revelation 20 or Apocalypse 20, then everything else is gravy. It's gravy. If you don't know where the binding of Satan occurs, then you're going to be lost. That, that is a foundational point. Now, we do have the Council of Ephesus saying, that the binding of Satan occurred at the cross. Okay? Just one brief statement. But that's basically all we need. Okay? Council of Ephesus, one of the major ecumenical councils. Okay? So that's enough for me. Okay? And uh, as I said, everything else becomes easy after you figure that out. Okay? All right. So it's five after five. I got to go. I'm starting to lose my voice. I'm still, believe it or not, not over my cold yet, unless I have some allergies. Maybe that's why it's hanging around so long. But at any rate, um, I'm sorry I didn't get too far today. It looks like there's a whole Swiss guard. Thank you so much. <laughs> Swiss guard. Yeah. How can I forget that? I wonder if they are Swiss. All right, so I congratulate you guys for staying around and listening for so long. Um, so I can go on and on, you know. Um, so all I can say is if you didn't get your question answered, 
today. Come back next week, which will be will be in April. 31st, 2nd, 3rd, April 3rd will be next Wednesday. So um, look forward to seeing you then. Um, stop by. Um, now where is my... Uh, there is our website. I forgot to put it up today. Uh, robertsongenis.org. Um, did I tell you we have the... Um, I think we have it up now. This is um, day two of how the world was made in six days. That is available now on a DVD. An hour and a half of just seat riveting adventure into the world of creation. Yours for, I forget, what is that? 1995 or something? Uh, so that's available. We have um, supersessionism is irrevocable available. This deals with the Jewish issue, as we were talking about today. You know, do the Jews have their own covenant with God? The big answer is no. And this book will tell you why. Um, well, and I'm working on some other stuff. Also, and uh, anyway, time to go. So we'll see you next week, and God bless you all, and remain faithful in the Lord until the day of his return. Bye-bye.